Welcome to episode 233 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to Kathy Sturman, who served in the FBI for 26 years. In this episode, she reviews her time overseas as a legal attache in charge of FBI offices in South Central Asia and China and discusses her memoir, It's Not About the Gun, Lessons from My Global Career as a Female FBI Agent where she examines the influence of attitude and gender in her journey to becoming an FBI legat, the most senior FBI representative in a foreign country. Kathy was the legat in India, based out of New Delhi, from 2006 through 2008, where she was responsible for oversight of all FBI interests and concerns in India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, and the Maldives. She was legat in Beijing from 2008 to 2011 with oversight of all FBI interests and concerns in the People's Republic of China and Mongolia. Her first FBI assignments after graduating from the academy were to the Alexandria, Virginia field office and the Washington field office, where she worked a variety of criminal investigations to include government fraud, healthcare fraud, public corruption, and environmental crime. She was selected to attend the Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California, where she studied Mandarin Chinese. Later, she had immersion and refresher courses in the language. Following language training, Kathy was assigned to the New York field office, where she served on a national security squad. She was transferred to the San Francisco office, where she worked on the International Terrorism Squad and a national security squad. For her next assignment, she was promoted to program manager for a major counterintelligence initiative at FBI headquarters. Her previously mentioned legat assignments followed her time at FBI headquarters. Kathy's last assignment prior to retirement was as supervisory special agent of a national security squad in the FBI's San Francisco division. You can learn more about Kathy Sturman and where to purchase her It's not about the gun, lessons from my global career as a female FBI agent on her website, kathysturman.com. The subtitle of this episode is Women in the FBI, so I must acknowledge the thousands of women who serve in non-agent roles in the Bureau, especially those who have supported me throughout my career and are still my friends today. This episode, however, is about women agents and the unique challenges they sometimes face on the job. Now, I expect that this will be a controversial episode. After listening to my interview with Kathy, you may have lots of questions. So I'm inviting you to a special Zoom meetup with Kathy to discuss her book and for us to answer any questions that you may have about being a woman in the FBI. Members of my reader team and Kathy's newsletter will receive an email with a link to the Zoom meetup and to bonus audio where we discuss why Kathy wrote the book, whether there's crying in the FBI, and if it's possible for women agents to serve in higher leadership roles and have a family. There's a link to join my reader team in your podcast app's description of this episode. Before we get to the interview, I want to welcome new listeners, especially those who were introduced to me and this podcast from the Insider.com YouTube interview I did featuring money laundering TV and movie clips. That was fun. If you missed it, check out the blog post on my website about the Insider.com YouTube video. I want to thank you for your support. Now here's the show. 
I want to welcome my guest, Kathy Sturman. Hey, Kathy, how are you? Hi, Jerry. Thank you for having me on your podcast. I just read your book. It's not about the gun. Lessons from my global career as a female FBI agent. Somebody once told me, a a male agent once told me that my crime fiction book was expectation shattering, meaning, you know, he started reading it and had no idea, you know, where I was going (laughs) to take the story. Well, I have to say the same thing about your memoir. It was expectation shattering. I started reading it and the transparency, the honesty, the vulnerability that you show in this book was like, uh uh-oh. No, she didn't go there. Your story was different than mine, but it brought up a lot of things in my career. The book was such a a mind-opening experience. Jerry, thank you. That is truly one of the highest compliments that I could ever get from somebody about my book, especially from a female agent, because yes, we all have different experiences in the FBI, but I think the challenges are still challenges. Now, I don't really go into it in the book a lot, but there were times when I actually stopped and said, is this worth it? Do I want to continue with this job as much as I love so many of the people that I got to work with and the amazing things that we get to do. I mean, it truly is a job like no other. I don't care what anybody says, even though it's not like TV shows and it's not like the movies, it really is a job like no other. So to look at the challenges and balance out, okay, Is it worth it to move forward with this job because of what I get to do and the people I get to do it with versus those very trying times? And obviously for you and for me, I think we both turned around and said, yeah, I can, I can get through this and not one single man is going to force me out of this job with his bad behavior. So yeah, I think in the end, it it made me just stronger and, you know, gave me that Stargate shield that I talk about in the book that, you know, you put that on before you head into a meeting or, you know, go into some high level talk and you say, I belong in this room just as much as those guys, no matter what they think, no matter what they say, no matter, you know, how many times they quirk their little eyebrows at me, I belong here and they're going to know it before I walk out of that room. One of the things that I try to do is never ask a female retired FBI guest a question that I wouldn't ask a male agent. If they bring up topics, you know, like you're doing today, then, Mm -hmm. you know, we get to go into it. But I don't I don't ask that question. So this is so exciting for me because we're going to be able to deal in this. I will say that I only question, is it worth it for the first four years? After that, things still happen. But not, this is for me personally, not at a point where I was saying, is this worth it? After those first four years, I decided, yeah, you know, I love this. I'm sticking with it. I know from reading your book, there were many, many times during your career that you just loved it and things were working well and you, you know, didn't have to deal with these challenges. So (laughs) I read your bio. So people have an understanding of where you're coming from which is a place of authority. I mean, you've done a lot in the FBI. Let's talk about that. I guess we could concentrate on the more than five years that you were representing the FBI in Beijing, China, and New Delhi, India. We've had a number of retired agents on talking about their time as legats representing the FBI internationally but never anybody talking about China or India. So I guess we should talk about India first. Sure. And why don't we start off with why you wanted to do this? You know, why you wanted to be a representative of the FBI internationally? One of the reasons why I did join the FBI is because I really wanted to do something different. And I wanted to do something that women had never done before. And I was curious about the world. And I loved language. And I always felt like even as a little girl, when I would read books, they were books about other countries and other cultures and other languages and other people. And that's, 
I mean, I'm just to this day, I'm just fascinated by it. And so when I got into the FBI, I honestly had no idea that the FBI had league out offices overseas. And at the time, they had very few. It wasn't until former director Louis Free came along and expanded the LIAT uh, program that we actually opened up more offices overseas. Even though it was something that I was really interested in, I knew that for me, it was a long shot. I mean, I was a female agent and it seemed that you had to have friends in high places to get the, the LIAT jobs. And I also thought to myself, even if I were to try for a LIAT position, I wanted to have a lot of years under my belt. Because if I were to be lucky enough to become a legat, I wanted to know what I was doing because I needed to exude the confidence that people expect of the FBI. So it wasn't until maybe 13 or 14 years into the Bureau, and I write about this a little bit in the books, I got breast cancer and I went through surgeries and chemo and radiation. And when I came through that, I said to my husband, the one thing I really, really want in my career, and I really want you to support me in it, is to become a legal attache. Because when you've had cancer, you sort of look at your life and go, you better be living your life now because tomorrow may never come. And so I said, my husband, Keith, I said, in order for me to try to become a legat, we're going to have to move to Washington, D.C. and I have to go to headquarters. And he was totally on board. I mean, the man has followed me around the world. So off I went to headquarters and started applying to legat positions. And I was lucky enough to first get to be legat New Delhi. And out of New Delhi, I covered all of India and Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and the Maldives. So it was um, quite a large territory. Most of the investigations I had there were terrorism investigations. There were some kidnappings. There were quite a few U.S. businessmen in India doing business. And there were always threats of, of kidnappings there by, you know, kidnappings of them or their children. But for the most part, it was all terrorism in all the countries, except for Bhutan, because Bhutan, according to the Bhutanese that I met with, there's no crime there. They're just a happy people. And <laughs> I believe that. As a legat, and you're talking about kidnappings and, you know, terrorism, for those who have not listened to the other episodes, what exactly are you doing? I mean, it's not like you're an FBI agent in New Delhi and you're running around with your gun and playing cops and robbers. Could you explain exactly as a legat what your responsibilities are? Well, this one case that I actually want to talk about, I picked it because it shows exactly what a legat does because, like you said, a legat, a legat is not out there like a, a regular street agent. You don't have casework that's all yours and you're going out with your gun and doing interviews. The legat is actually the person who coordinates a lot of moving parts. And one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this case is because it really shows the teamwork that is required for an international investigation. This particular investigation involved the um, Sri Lankan LTTE, which is the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam. And just to give you a quick history of who LTTE is, in Sri Lanka, there was basically a civil war that had been going on for about 30 years. In the late 70s, the Tamils, who are the minority people in Sri Lanka and live basically in the north, they're Hindu versus the Sinhalese who are Buddhist, the majority, and they live in the southern part of Sri Lanka. And for those of those who don't know where Sri Lanka is, it's a teardrop shaped country at the very southern tip of India. Incredibly beautiful. So the LTTE who are Tamils, they wanted to have a separate state. They wanted it to be basically ethnically clean. And so they wanted to divide from the Buddhist Sinhalese and have their own Hindu Tamil state. So they started a lot of riots and formed this, this organization, which eventually 
was designated a foreign terrorist organization by the State Department in, I believe, 1997. So the LTTE was a very violent faction. And basically, from like 1980 until the late 90s, they committed more suicide attacks than any other organization in the entire world. They assassinated numerous Sri Lankan ministers. They were responsible for assassinating India's former prime minister, Rajiv Gandhi. And interestingly enough, the person who assassinated, the suicide bomber who assassinated the former uh, Indian prime minister was a female. She was the only female, the first female in recent history that had committed a crime like this as a female suicide bomber. And I think I mentioned in the book that the people that I worked with in Colombo basically said to me, did you know that Sri Lanka invented the female suicide bomber? And they didn't say it with pride. I think that they were just, it's just a fact. So anyway, fast forward, because people have asked me this question when I talk about this case, they're like, why does the FBI care about a terrorism case or a civil war in, in Sri Lanka? So fast forward to after 9-11 and the LTTE had members all around the world and quite a few of them ended up in the United States. And they were here in the United States and they were trying to raise money and buy weapons to send back to Sri Lanka to support the Tamils. So the FBI had caught wind of this and they set up two undercover operations. Now, the first undercover operation was an FBI agent. This was out of the Newark office and the Eastern District of New York U.S. Attorney's Office. The FBI set up a first undercover operation. And because the LTTE wanted to get off the State Department terrorist list. So the LTTE met with this undercover agent who was posing as a State Department employee, but was actually FBI. And they were going to pay a million dollars to the State Department employee to try to get off the terrorism list. So that was the first undercover operation. The second was FBI agents posing as weapons dealers and the LTT turned around and they wanted to buy like numerous hundreds of AK-47s and surface to air missiles so that they could basically blow up Sri Lankan military uh, planes. So those were the two undercover operations. And it involved about 20 other FBI offices around the country, but also 10 other countries around the world. There was a nation international wide takedown about a month after I arrived in Delhi. So that was, this is one of the first things I had to deal with. So I flew down to, I had gone down to Sri Lanka a couple of times before to meet with everybody. But on the day of the takedown, I flew down to Sri Lanka so that I could be there with all of the Sri Lankan officials that I worked with, the attorney general and the secretary of defense and their Navy, and also to be there to brief our ambassador in our U.S. embassy in Colombo. And one of the reasons the FBI wanted me there is because once the word went out that all of the, the arrests were, were, had happened around the world and in the United States, they were concerned about backlash by Sri Lankan citizens. And so I was basically the conduit to sort of filter intelligence to them so that they could make appropriate decisions. And also continue briefing the ambassador because the ambassador was, was going to be probed by the media, the Sri Lankan media. And this way he would have minute by minute updates to provide to the appropriate people who were going to be reaching out to him. The takedown happened. And after that, I mean, there were a ton of moving parts that the Newark division handled. And, you know, they just a phenomenal group of agents and analysts and administrative personnel. But after the takedown happened, I basically coordinated Newark agents to come out to Sri Lanka and to meet with all the, all the Sri Lankan officials I had met with, the Secretary of Defense and the Attorney General, the Secretary of Navy, to talk about how this prosecution was going to move forward and to share intelligence on how basically it would be best to prosecute the, the people that they had arrested. 
So I brought those group of agents out. And then later, the Department of Justice has a unit called the Office of International Affairs, another phenomenal group of attorneys who are experts in all of the countries that they cover for the FBI. And so I had a couple of attorneys who were just experts in Sri Lankan law and Indian law and basically the law of every country that I covered. So they came out along with TFOS, our um, terrorist finance people who track the money. As you know, in terrorism, you know, the best way to, 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 to get them is to track the money. So I brought them out and they met with the Central Bank of Sri, Sri Lanka, which interestingly enough, had been bombed about a decade before by the LTTE with a, a truck bomb. It's so very similar to the one that killed the Marines in Beirut. And so we met with them. And later on, there were investigators that came out from the Eastern District U.S. Attorney's Office and some more agents from Newark. And we went to a military base where the Sri Lankan military had gathered weapons and IEDs for evidence so that we could then ship it back to the United States and use it as evidence in the trial that was going to be coming up. Because the LTTE terrorists were in the United States, the trial was going to take place in the United States. But the um, Sri Lankan government and their military and their attorney general, they were assisting the FBI in order to best give them the evidence that they needed you know, following the money trail, the evidence in the form of IEDs and guns, and just all of the intelligence that they could possibly give us in order to have that at the trial in the United States. So my point in talking about this case is that, you know, I this wasn't my case. It was a case that originated in the United States, but it takes a legal attache to be that person sort of in the middle to coordinate a lot of the moving parts. And it's a huge team of people. I think one of the things that I absolutely loved about this case is it was one of the first major cases like this that I actually got to help out with. And when I say help out, you know, I was just the person who was helping the Newark office and the Sri Lankans in order to prosecute these terrorists. And it's, it's just a huge team of people. And I was so incredibly amazed at how wonderful everybody was to work with from the Sri Lankan government officials to everybody at the U.S. Embassy in Colombo to DOJ's Office of International Affairs and their attorneys and the Newark agents and the Eastern District of New York all of the attorneys there. It was just incredible. That was sort of the building block for me when it came to other investigations and cases that I got to help out with as the league at both in India and other countries that I covered. And then, you know, later in, in China. And so to, to kind of sum it up as a league at you are the liaison coordinating yes. between the FBI in the U.S. and, you know, the foreign country, you know, where you're assigned, you're the person that's pulling that all together. You're Absolutely. the, you're, you're the, the, the common face, the common friend so that the FBI doesn't have to renew and have to develop relationships. You're there as the relationship builder for the FBI. Absolutely. And that's why it's so important to enjoy that type of communication and enjoy developing those kinds of relationships. And that was to me, just being at the league at all in, in all the places where I covered being that person and, and having the opportunity. I mean, I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to develop these relationships and get to know all these people. And to me, that was just incredible. And I think that. Uh, as a league at, if you don't enjoy developing those relationships and, and having to basically sometimes cold call someone very high up in a foreign government, if you're not comfortable with that and you don't like that, then it's probably not a job for you. But I loved it. And it was a huge confidence builder. And I really got to know 
people from other countries and, and what they thought and what they believed. And it was, it was that dream that I had as a little girl. It's like, I get to know people from other countries and I get to hear their language and taste their food and understand them and, and, you know, see who they really are. And it was incredible. Well, tell me, how did you feel about India and how did India feel about the FBI? First of all, I love India. When I first got there, I had done a TDY, I think a 45 day TDY in India before I went over as league at. So I knew what I was getting into. And when I got there for my permanent assignment, a lot of people from other agencies said, you're, you're either going to love it or you're going to hate it because there are very few people in between. So I loved India. I loved it from the, the first time I went on my TDY. And it's a tough country to live in, but it's so incredibly alive and the people are wonderfully friendly and it's, it's colorful and you just never know what's going to happen from day to day and, and what you're going to see. And you can literally stand in, in one spot and turn 360 degrees and live a lifetime. It's just that incredible. And so I loved it. And as far as what India thought of the FBI, every single country that I worked in, with maybe the exception of China, <laughs> looked at the FBI with the highest regard. And for me, that was another major lesson to learn is because I realized I was the FBI's representative and it really was up to me to put my best face forward, my best foot forward, my best word forward, because they expect so much of the FBI. And I was determined to give them everything that they asked for if it was in my power to give it to them and, and be cooperative. So I would have to say every country Every person that I met just thinks the FBI is this incredible organization. And it is, but I, I th their expectations were quite a bit higher than something, sometimes what we could actually do. But it was, it was a lesson. And I, you know, it just stuck with me that I needed to be that, that representative. And I had to be the best me that I could possibly be, the best FBI that I could possibly be. Now, you, you mentioned this before, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood that you were based in New Delhi, India, but you covered a variety of countries in that particular area. And yes. those again were Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, the Maldives, and then all of India. Okay. Wow. And you were, there's a thing in the book also where you talk about an opportunity you had to be one of the first FBI agents to testify in Indian court. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. And it really sort of brings up what I was just talking about when someone would ask me for assistance or their, or help from the Indian government or any of the other governments that I covered. I was like, sure. What do you need? I'm with the FBI. I'll help you. And so the Indian CBI, a Central Bureau of Investigation, that's the FBI equi equivalent in India, they had an investigation that they had been working on since before 2000, before 9-11. One of their very wealthy businessmen had been kidnapped. He was being held for ransom and we later learned that basically that the company that this man owned paid the ransom and that ransom money was then, you know, basically used as part of uh, the financing for 9-11, but we didn't know that then. So anyway, the, the person who was responsible for the kidnapping subsequently was jailed and prosecuted for an attack on the American Center in Calcutta or Kolkata. The American Center is basically an offsite for the American embassy. And so this terrorist, I will call him a terrorist, if that's what he was, he had attacked the center and ended up killing four or five of the guards that basically protected the American center. So he was already in jail. 
And the Indian government had asked the FBI to trace some phone calls that were related to the kidnapping of this wealthy businessman. Well, it turns out that the phone calls were made in Dubai, but they were routed through the United States through Sprint. So the FBI basically provided the the phone records to show where the phone calls were routed from and who they were routed from and that whole scenario. So they had this terrorist in jail and they had already prosecuted him for the attack on the American Center, but now they realized he was also the uh, mastermind of the kidnapping. So they were you know, going to hold a trial on the kidnapping itself. And they asked me if I would be willing to testify to the veracity of the phone records that we had provided them. And of course, I said, sure, no problem. You know, I'm more than happy to testify in Indian court. So that was naive me. I had no idea that FBI personnel can't just go testify in a a court in a foreign country. So when I told FBI headquarters that this is what I was going to do, they were like, hold off on that for about five minutes. And what ended up happening was happening was I had to coordinate with the FBI's legal counsel. And again, the Department of Justice's Office of International Affairs, their attorneys, and then also with uh, some State Department attorneys, because there has to be a lot of diplomatic paperwork that needs to be done in order to allow a U.S. law enforcement official, in this case, the FBI, to testify in a, a foreign trial. So it took a couple of months for all of this paperwork to be written up. And then, of course, the evidence that we were providing in the form of basically just, you know, paper work showing, you know, the, the flow of the phone calls that had to be certified so that it would be allowed in, a, in a, a foreign court. And so, you know, I bring up that case because, you know, I was very naive. I I didn't know that I just couldn't go down to 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 Calcutta and, and, and show up in court and testify. So that was a lesson again. in when a foreign government makes a request like that, there are a lot of moving parts and it's a whole team of people that do so much incredible work behind the scenes in order to allow me to travel and testify in court. And so that's what I got to do. Yeah. And it was a, a big deal, you know, it made the papers, made the news that uh, you were testifying. It did because the, first of all, it was supposed to be uh, very low key and there was supposed to be no media coverage because this, the, the terrorist was quite well known and there were some indications that he had had his fingers in other terrorist attacks, not just in India. And so Everyone wanted it to be very low key that someone from the FBI was actually going to testify against this man. So I thought, no problem. It's going to be, you know, one of those I'll just slip in and slip out. No big deal. Well, the day before I was supposed to testify, it showed up in the news that an FBI man was going to testify in court. And I thought, and there, there are other little stories that I tell in the book about how, you know, people would think that I was a man and then I would show up and I would be a woman. They'd be like, what, who are you? So anyway, you know, in the newspaper, they were expecting a man to show up in court. Of course, the, the, the officials that I had been talking to and working with, they knew I was a woman, but so I guess it was a good thing that they thought I was a man. Yeah. Mr. (laughs) Kathy. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So, yeah, you know, when I get there that morning to testify in court, you know, again, in the newspaper today, the FBI is testifying in court and it was on the front page of the Times of India. And I thought, well, crap, you know, now everybody knows that I'm here. And again, I didn't think about it uh, until the gentleman that I had been dealing with, he basically said, we have to make the prison safe for you, Miss Kathy. And then when I got there, there was this whole entourage of, of people in cars and guns and, and it, they were there to protect me. 
And I had no idea that it was going to be such a big deal. And, and I think it was testifying in a prison. I'm testifying in a prison because they didn't want to move the, the defendant. So I was going to go to the prison where they had set up this makeshift courtroom. And so I was going to testify in prison. And, you know, and I still, you know, really wasn't afraid, even though when I showed up, I was expecting one person in a car to pick me up and take me to court and then take me back to the airport. But it was this whole entourage of, of people with guns. And it finally hit me that they were there to protect me because they were a little concerned because it had been printed in the newspaper that morning that I was going to be there. Let's touch a little bit on China before we move to our our, our, our main topic of, of your book. But I would think it would be fascinating, you know, especially now, but definitely when you were in China to be again, the FBI's representative. So, and you were there for over three years. Is that right? It was about three years. Yeah. But I had done a couple of, well, actually I had done a few TDYs in China when I was at FBI headquarters. So again, I knew what I was getting into. Let I me ask this question. Is it normal for legats to do multiple countries back to back? Because usually I hear from somebody who was, I've talked to somebody who was the legat in Paris or the legat in Japan or the legat in Ghana. And then they come back home and, and continue up the FBI, you know, ladder of, of success. But you went from India and then you went to China. Back then, there was sort of a, it wasn't really a, a hard and fast rule that if you didn't spend too many years overseas at, at, at a time, then you were okay. But once you spent more than five or six years overseas without coming back, they were concerned about, I think, obviously, perception and maybe someone trying to recruit you from a foreign power, from a foreign intelligence service. But there were other legats who actually did more back-to-back countries than I did. So it wasn't all that unusual. I think it was maybe unusual for me because I was a female legat. But my particular expertise happened to be China. So after India, China had just opened up. It was just a timing thing. And I had studied Chinese at the Defense Language Institute for two and a half years. So I spoke Mandarin and China was a a great deal of my focus in my FBI career. So I think that's why they, they turned to me and said, would you be willing to go straight to China after India? And of course, I, I was a little tired after India. It was pretty exhausting. But when I told Keith, my husband, you know, what do you think I should do? He was like, are you kidding me? You've been working for this your entire career. Of course, you have to say yes. So, of course, I said yes. You know, one of the things I think I forgot, I didn't mention it in your when I read your bio, but we should stress to people that your area of expertise, of investigative expertise, you had actually been working counterintelligence before you took these positions overseas. And yes. so was was that one of the reasons that you were very interested in working in China also? Oh, absolutely. I had been working Chinese counterintelligence since the early 90s when most people didn't care about Chinese counterintelligence and couldn't find China on a map. So I actually started in that area at a a phenomenal time in the FBI. And I watched that program grow. And so I loved it. I love counterintelligence. And that's really what I wanted to do when I joined the FBI. I wanted to work counterintelligence. And I was incredibly lucky to get to do that. I never in a million years thought I would ever get to be legat Beijing. I just thought it wouldn't happen. So when this opportunity came up, I mean, I was, I was still a little reluctant um, because I was a little worn out from India. But at the same time, It was an amazing experience. Working with the Chinese government is more than challenging. There were so many times when I felt like I just wanted to beat my head against a brick wall. And having said that, there were some wonderful people that I met 
that I worked with in the Chinese government, but I also know that they knew that we were never going to keep in touch. We were never going to be friends. And as much as they might like me and respect me and vice versa, we were never, ever going to be friends like I am with so many other people from the other countries that I covered. All right. So now you've got to tell us what some of these challenges were that made this a little bit different, you know, in your in your responsibilities than it was when you were working in India and those other countries, those other southeastern countries. China is a, a high threat country. And when I say high threat, it's a high intelligence threat country. And it could oftentimes be a very contentious relationship. China was or had already become a very important economic partner with the United States. But at the same time, the FBI had basically started focusing on economic espionage where China was concerned. And there were a lot of investigations that came out when I was LEGAT where the FBI had arrested someone for um, stealing secrets They had gotten a job with a specific corporation or a government agency, and they were arrested for either economic espionage or just, you know, straight out espionage. And so whenever things like that would happen, of course, I would always get called over to the MPS and, you know, get chewed out about how China doesn't steal from the United States and China doesn't do this and China doesn't do that. And, you know, of course, I had to maintain my composure and Sure. Yeah. Right. And you know, it's kind of funny. I wasn't there for this particular event, but I was told about it. It was before I became legat and Robert Mueller had gone over to China for uh, some meetings. And the Chinese said, we really wish that you would stop accusing us of, you know, stealing things from you and committing, you know, espionage. And he said, well, I will when you stop doing it. (laughs) Good one. <laughs> and you know, like I said, I wasn't there for it, but I heard about it and I could certainly see that happening. So there were there were those challenges. Also, being a high threat country, I was followed pretty much everywhere I went. And we're pretty sure our apartment was bugged. To read about your place being bugged was absolutely terrifying because I mean, you believed and had proof, you know, that somebody was in there. Somebody was watching you constantly, you know, and this is your, you know, your home, your intimate area that you shared with your husband. And, you know, they were monitoring everything all the time. Yeah, you, I don't want to say you get used to it, but you learn to not talk about certain things. You learn to, be very quiet in your interactions. And of course, you know, when Keith and I were about to have a fight or something, it would be like, we have to go to my office and have a fight (laughs) because it was the only place where we could have some privacy. Uh, And Keith was allowed in my office, which was was a classified space because he had gotten a job. He'd gotten a, a top secret clearance and he worked at the embassy on the computer. So he actually at the time worked for the state department. So Keith and I weren't going to have a fight in our apartment so that uh, the Chinese could listen to it and try to tear that apart. So we would go to my office and discuss whatever we were going to discuss. But we never really talked about anything in our apartment that was of any consequence. And you learn not to talk about people at the embassy, give out any personal private information you might know about someone else who worked at the embassy to maybe point out a vulnerability that someone else had. So we talked very little, except about just, you know, innocuous things. And we did have a few notepads where we would write stuff down and where we wanted to share something and and not have it heard. And then I would take those notes to my office and shred them when I would go to the office the next time. But yeah, it was it was an interesting experience. Yeah, well, what a way to live. <laughs> For those who have not listened to the other LEGAT episodes, when we're talking about you being the FBI's representative, there's usually only one or two other FBI agents working with you as your assistant legal attache 
officers there. So when you talked about being kind of worn out and exhausted when you left India and now you're in China, talk a little bit about just the workload that you have. It's true. Most legat offices only have three, four people. There are a few offices who have more, your larger offices who have a lot more traffic coming through, a lot more leads like London and maybe Australia, Canberra. But for the most part, like my office in in Delhi, it was me and the LOS who was fabulous, wonderful, fantastic, by the way. You got to break, you got to break down that acronym. Legat office specialist. Basically, they, I don't want to say the FBI's administrative person there because they do so much more. I mean, they're basically the office manager. They handle so many things. And frankly, a lot of the LOSs, the legal office specialists have been in several legal offices. So they know how a legal office is supposed to run. And if you're a good legat, you learn to listen to and trust your LOS because that person is going to teach you a lot. So I learned a lot from my LOS in Delhi and also from my LOS in Beijing. Incredible, wonderful, absolutely fabulous people. That's the same thing, you know, in a field office back in the States because, and I know there's we changed the title, but we used to call them squad secretaries. Mm-hmm. I mean, as a new agent coming in or just as a veteran agent transferring to a new office, you know, your squad secretary is the one who helped get you straight about everything, not just the paperwork and, you know, where to find the file room, but everything that occurred in that field office because uh, they were the staples on that squad. They, they knew, you know, how to get things done. Oh, absolutely. And it was the same thing in the legal office. And when I was in Delhi, I was by myself for the first six months. I didn't have an ALAT because the previous ALAT had rotated out and I didn't have another ALAT yet. So I was there by myself for six months. And there were so many things going on, an upcoming inspection, a visit by the deputy director, John Pistol, and then, you know, just numerous terrorism investigations. And you're flying here and flying there and you're, you're just running as fast as you can. And then on top of that, you have middle of the night phone calls every night, multiple phone calls, people who will call you up and need you right away. And they either, you know, it doesn't matter what time of night it is for you. They need to talk to you. And then there are people who can't figure out the time zones. And that if you're in New Delhi, India, and it's nine o'clock on the East Coast, it's not going to be nine o'clock in the morning in New Delhi. So you have a lot of those, those middle of the night calls. A lot of times you, I would have to get up out of bed. And if it was something classified, I'd have to go into the embassy. I didn't know it didn't matter what time of night. And you have to set up the whole office and, and set up all your systems, which takes time. And then you'd have to log onto your computer, make phone calls or whatever. And there would be a lot of nights where I would be in the office in sweatpants or whatever. And the regular workday would start and then I would run home and shower up and then come back in my normal suit attire. But yeah, it was, it's, it's challenging, especially when you don't have a lot of people in the office and it's up to you and your ALAD and your LOS. And in Beijing, I was lucky. I had an analyst. He was also Chinese American. So he, he did a lot of translation work for me in the paperwork. And then when we went to certain meetings and I needed for him to be the interpreter to talk about things in Chinese that I couldn't say in Mandarin, like intercontinental ballistic missiles. <laughs> I mean, you know, so I used to be able to say that in Chinese, believe it or not, but I didn't think that I had the capability to have those conversations uh, on an official level. So he was incredible in that regard too. I just know reading the book, you know, you really get an understanding of the high level of functioning, (laughs) I had to say, that you had to have the, you know, the adrenaline, the cortisol, and I I could just feel it all kind of pumping, you know, through your body as you had to deal with these different tasks and different people. But in trying to do your job, there were other factors and other challenges 
that you had to deal with. Something that I think was like a highlight for me in reading your book, even though it was towards the end, but I thought that it kind of summed up everything that you had to say. And it was a conversation that you had with director Muller, who is not known for chit chat, but no, yeah, you were with them. Uh, was he visiting you in China or in India? This was a trip to Beijing. Director Muller came to Beijing several times when I was Liat there because he knew that cooperation with China was very, very important because China was becoming an important partner to the United States, but it was also an adversary. And, you know, trying to focus on that balance as the FBI, he knew was really important. So he came there uh, a few times, which when I was there and It's always a really, really uh, busy, challenging time when somebody like Director Mueller visits a legal office. If you get the phone call, Director Mueller's coming to visit you, you think, oh, my God, you know, all the work that I'm going to have to put aside or basically you work 24 seven, which you're pretty much doing anyway. But this is more like, you know, 25, eight in order to do your work and do all the work that needs that's involved with getting Robert Mueller on the ground and setting up his meetings and the briefing books and all of that. (laughs) Exactly. All right. So this conversation happens when you're in a vehicle traveling someplace. This was his very last trip to Beijing. And it was my last, probably like my last six months in China because I was getting ready to rotate out. And we had just finished a few days of meetings, and I was in the car with him on the way back to the airport to put him back on his plane. And he had turned to me. I mean, he, he you're right. He's not, you do not chit chat with Robert Mueller. You sit there quietly and you wait till he asks you a question and then you answer it with very short, concise answers because he doesn't want to hear any extra information that you have to offer or even your opinion, unless it's a professional's opinion. And when he turned to me in the car and he said, may I ask you a question? And I thought, well, well, no, no, you wrote, (laughs) you wrote, he said, can I ask you a personal personal question? question. Question. Right. That's important. Yes. A personal question. And by his tone, he was obviously asking a serious question. And then I was kind of freaked out because he never asked personal questions. I mean, I, he had never asked me a personal question in the whole time I had ever worked with him. So, of course, I said, well, of course. I was thinking, you can ask me whatever you want. I mean, you're the director. And uh, he let said... Me, let, no, let me play the role. Let me let okay, play the okay. role. Because this will be the only time I'll ever get to, you know, I'm the director of the FBI. All right. So he says to you, you've been legat in multiple countries dominated by men, some predominantly Muslim. Did you ever feel you couldn't do your job because you're a woman? You know what? That question just shocked me out of my shoes. I, it was a question I I totally did not expect him to ask. And I was really curious as to why he was asking it. And then, you know, of course, all these thoughts are going through my head and about, you know, a five second, you know, time frame, And then I thought, should I be honest? Or should I just sort of gloss over this? Like, I think a lot of female agents have learned to gloss over tough questions like that. And I thought, you know what, uh, to hell with it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to be honest, because I had always tried to be honest with with Director Mueller in a very professional way. I was never one of these legats who tried to suck up to him. And I thought, you know what, that it's not, that's not who I am. I'm, I'm just going to be honest. And I told him, I said, you know, director, I said, I have been treated like a queen by everyone that I have met overseas. And they have given me everything I've asked for if it was in their power to give. And I said, I have been treated worse and been discriminated against more by my own colleagues, FBI colleagues than I ever was overseas. And then I sort of hesitated and I thought, well, I hope he doesn't perceive this as me being a smart ass because then I said, and frankly, director, you need to know that. 
And he looked at me with, you know, he, I mean, when he looks at you, I mean, it's like with a laser focus and you think, oh my gosh, you know, am I going to get fired? And so he, he just stared at me for just a few seconds and he turned away and then he turned back and looked at me and he said, yeah, I, I, I guess I did need to know that. And, you know, I put him on the plane and he got back to the United States and, you know, he didn't call me to fire me. So <laughs> I figured I was okay. <laughs> All right. So here's my question. Sure. Now that he has this information that seemed to have really set him back a bit, what did he do about it? What did he do with that information? To be honest, I'm not sure he did anything. I don't know if maybe he wanted to. I don't know. He was at the end of his career by that time. And I could tell that from the first time I worked with Robert Mueller till the last time he came to Beijing, I could see that he was he was tired, you know, and, and who wouldn't be? I mean, the man started as FBI director the week before 9-11. So his entire career was just running as fast as he could in an organization that was had worked terrorism before, but not on the scale that we were going to work it after 9-11. So I, I could see a little bit of a difference in him, but I think what I don't understand, and this is just my personal opinion, and I always say this now when I talk about the FBI, this is my opinion, it's not the opinion of the FBI. But, you know, I look at the subsequent directors and I ask myself, why have we not diversified the FBI more? Why are there not more women? I mean, by this time, this is 2021, we should have more females in the FBI. We should have more minorities in the FBI. Our FBI should reflect our society and our society is very diverse. And of course, I totally agree with you. I mean, that's one of the key messages that I talk about, you know, on this podcast and any interviews that I do for any other media source. I don't know if our conversation here today is going to help. <laughs> so let's get into that a little bit. But I want to start from the very beginning that in your, in your book, and again, it's not about the gun. Lessons from my global career as a female FBI agent. I love that title because the truth is your first indication that there may be some gender bias in the FBI was all about the gun. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I wanted the book to have that title for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons is so many people that I've met in the United States and around the world, do you carry a gun? It's one of the first questions I get, do you carry a gun? And over the years of my career, and I'm sure you found the same thing, like your gun was such a small part of what you actually did on a day-to-day -day basis. And especially overseas, because you don't get to carry a gun, you're not allowed. And so the gun itself became less and less important. And, you know, I realized when I first came back from overseas, how much my opinion about guns had changed. And that's, that's an aside. And, and, you know, we can talk about that later, or people can buy the book and read the story. So my career actually started with a gun. It started on the, the range at the FBI Academy. I know from talking to other female agents that a lot of their issues with the FBI started on the range at the FBI Academy when they were a brand new agent trying just to, 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 to make it through training. But in my particular case, my firearms instructor decided, I don't know, he didn't like women, which I don't think he did. He was a bit of a misogynist and he wanted me out and he wanted to see me fail. And so I grew up in Kentucky. So I was familiar with guns and I had shotguns. So I go on the range the first time and I mean, I, I shot pretty well. It wasn't, you know, a bullseye target or anything, but, you know, I did a lot better than a lot of people. So the next time I go out and I go shooting and I realize nothing's hitting a target. 
And I kept telling him, there's something wrong with my gun. There's something wrong with my gun. And he kept saying to me, there's nothing wrong with your gun, Steerman. You just can't shoot. Why don't you just leave now? You're never going to make it through. And he taunted and he, me. And he actually said that to you. He actually said that to me multiple times. And he taunted me every time I was on the range. He, he left the sand right behind me, right at my right ear. He would say things like, you're not going to make it. You can't shoot. Why don't you just leave now? Just give up. You know, you're not, you're not made to be an FBI agent. And, you know, I finally stopped telling him that I thought there was something wrong with my gun. And then finally, one of my classmates who was a former state trooper, I asked him to stand behind me. And I said, will you tell me where my bullets are going when I shoot dead center? And so he stood behind me and he said, they're going, you know, lower left, lower right. So I'm from Kentucky. Which is what you would think a firearms instructor would have been standing behind you and telling you. Exactly. So, you know, being from Kentucky, I know what Kentucky windage is. It's like if your bullets are going lower right, you need to shoot upper left in order to get them to center. And so that's what I started doing whenever I would aim at my target. I didn't aim dead center. I aimed upper left. And that's how I passed firearms training at Quantico until the very last day. I had passed all of the, the uh, firearms tests and I went to the gun vault to get my gun. Well, the guy behind the counter, he couldn't find it. And the firearms instructor came up behind me and he said, it's on the repair rack. And the guy behind the, in the, behind, in the vault, he sort of Look confused, but he went over to the repair rack. Sure enough, there was a gun with my name on it. Nothing else was said. I go out to the range, aim upper left, and nothing. And I thought, repair rack, I've already passed. Let me just see if I've been right about this guy all along. I aimed dead center, and sure enough, there were all my shots. And he actually had the nerve to tell me that he tried to get me booted out. He wanted me gone. And he actually had the nerve to say, congratulations, you made it. Why? Why you? You know, I think it was just because I was a woman. I was a female and he decided to pick a woman and I was the one that he picked. So I don't know. There were eight or eight other females in the class. Maybe he just didn't like, I don't know my name, the way I look, I don't know. Well, I have to say, you know, when I was down at Quantico, I did not have any problems with shooting. Later in my career, I did. But Quantico, I was, I was, you know, I had no problem whatsoever. I had no problem with the physical fitness. I had no problem with the academics. But I did have problems at Quantico. Oh, boy, did I have problems. I had problems with chain of command. I had problems with asking questions. I had... (laughs) You know, and they wrote it, you know, on the write-up that they give you, they they send to your next office that I had problems with the chain of command because I asked she a lot of questions. She questions authority. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yes. I asked a lot of questions because of things that were said and done. I'll just share this real quick story about how the very first practical problem that we had for our class, it was going to be a kidnapping. And when they selected all the people to participate, they were all men except for one woman in our class who had been a Omaha homicide detective. They all got to play major roles. My, my roommate and I, you know, we got assigned to go get some keys for a building. It was just ridiculous. <laughs> and so the next day when they do the hot wash, you know, and go over, you know, how the, the class went, I raised my hand and I said, who selected? Who was going to do what? Because aren't we in training? Wouldn't you think that the people who have never, ever participated in an arrest would be picked to do these things instead of people that had already done them? And, oh, I had one guy in the class turn to me who had been a former NCI. Well, it doesn't matter difference what he was. But one of the guys in the class turned to me and said, you don't want to be the person that goes through the door first. You don't want to have that responsibility. And I said, hell, if I don't, I mm-hmm. wouldn't be here if I didn't want to do this. And so that's kind of how I started, you know, at the FBI Academy. And so I can relate. But 
we're having an honest and open and transparent conversation. Yes. I think the main thing that we need to stress, because I don't want to scare any women off, is that <laughs> we loved our careers. And despite of the things that may have happened for me at the beginning, you know, there's some things that happened during my career that weren't anywhere near as bad that did not stop me from wanting to be an agent. But at the beginning, it was there were some challenges. I truly believe, and I believe this from the very beginning, and let me see your thoughts on it, that the type of woman in most cases who joins the FBI is totally different than the type of man that joins the FBI. The woman is a feminist. You know, women can do anything. The world's our oyster in a more of a liberal stand. And the type of man who joins the FBI is very conservative. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of times when there are clashes, you know, it's because of that. Now, did I get along with everybody that I worked with? For the most part, absolutely. I mean, because there are more men in the FBI than women, most of my friends in the FBI, dear, close friends that I went to lunch with and I hung out with every day were men. I completely agree with what you said about the men and the women. And I have said this to people so many times. It's, it's, it's wonderful to hear you say the same thing because I tell people for the most part, the men who join the FBI, they're pretty much the same. They're conservative. They have a certain viewpoint when it comes to the world and women's place in it. Women who join the FBI, they're dynamic, baby. Every single woman who joins the FBI is a dynamic person. She is different. She's different because she wanted to join the FBI. She wanted to do, she wanted to take on this job that is still looked upon as mysterious. You know, it's like what's behind the curtain where the FBI is concerned. And women who want to take on that job, I believe they're stronger to a certain degree. They're stronger in their personality. They're stronger in their convictions. They look at the world differently, like you're saying. They're definitely more liberal. I think women are willing to look at the differences in people and be more accepting, which brings me back around to one of my very first points. If the FBI would just hire more women, then it would be a much better organization. Okay, so somebody's listening to this who is interested in joining the FBI. By listening to our conversation, honest, transparent, vulnerable conversation, why would they want to join the FBI? Especially a, a woman. I know my answer. I, I, I just curious as to what you would say to them. Is, is your book a warning? No, the book is not a warning. I, I wrote the book because I, I, first of all, I want to start an honest, open, transparent conversation about the FBI. I wrote it from a woman's viewpoint because I want young women who are looking at joining the FBI, I want them to go into it with their eyes open, not naively like I did. But I And I want them to know that they can go into the FBI and they don't have to change themselves. They can be who they are. I change for the FBI. And I feel like I'm a harder, more brittle person because of it. I'm trying to change that aspect about myself. But I want women to go into the job thinking I can be me and the me that I am can bring something to the table because the FBI is a job like no other. I don't care what anybody says. It is truly a unique organization. It's a unique group of people. Every day you get to do something different. You have no idea what every day is going to bring. And that's whether you're a street agent, a lead at, it doesn't matter. Every day is different and you're going to get to do something so new and so unique. And this really came back to me when I retired because, you know, I thought I need to get one of those jobs that everybody gets after the FBI. And after I did some interviews, I was bored stiff just doing the interviews. Like, why would I want to do that? Because it will never, ever, ever be like the job I had in the FBI, which was so dynamic and changeable. And yes, did it have its challenges? Absolutely. But it was just 
an incredible experience. It great gave me an incredible foundation. It gave me phenomenal confidence. I made lifelong friends who I could call them now and they've got my back. I know that you don't always get that in other organizations. And I think you develop those relationships because the reality is in the FBI, you have to have each other's backs. And so you learned a level of trust that I think that is difficult to, to gain in other jobs. And no matter where you go, no matter where you go in this country, and even now overseas, I have people that I worked with, I dealt with, I know I can reach out to them and they're going to understand you and where you come from simply because of the job that you had with the FBI. And I do want to stress that we're talking about our experiences. There are going to be lots of women in the FBI, women agents who are going to say, that was not my experience. Nothing happened. Nobody said anything. Nobody challenged me. Okay, that's good for you. But we're just talking about what happened with us. And again, we came in much earlier. Women looking at me and you, Jerry, and they're going, okay. Like you said, why would they want to join the FBI? Because there's a lot of good in it and you can do a lot of good in it. And you as a young woman can go into it with your eyes open. So I, I don't know if that answers, you know, your question about why, why things are happening now. I think it's just because things just haven't changed like we need for them to change. We just haven't evolved that far yet. And that's what I'm saying about the Bureau needing to change. And I shouldn't say change, but the Bureau needs to evolve. I like to use the word, you know, evolve versus change because evolving means that you're moving forward into something better. And I think that the FBI can evolve into something better, but we have to look at who we were in the past who we were in the past is the story that I'm trying to tell and the stories that that you try to tell through your podcasts and who we are now and who are we now is a direct result of who we were. So, okay, that's great. Who we were, who we are, but where do we want to go? Where does the FBI want to go? Wow. There's so much I'm feeling as we're going through this conversation because I have spent five years now just really (laughs) pumping up the FBI and, and, and being honest, but this conversation is the most honest and I'm feeling a little scared. I'm feeling a little nervous. I'm feeling the tension of what people who are listening to this are thinking. 1972. July of 1972, the first two women joined the FBI. Next year, in 2022, will be 50 years of women in the FBI. And I plan to do something big, and I don't know what it is, but now I'm feeling the challenge of making sure that that has true meaning. Damn you, Kathy. You know, Jerry, I, I, I'm scared too, and, I, and I'm nervous. And when I was writing the book, I had this little devil sitting on my shoulder. And that little devil said, are you sure you want to say that? Oh. I even had my agent, you know, when she read through the final manuscript, she was like, are you sure you want to say that? And my editor, you know, when they were going through the copy editing and everything, there was a comment that it was a suggestion, I should say. Maybe I should tone it down a little. That made me angry. I, and I, I got really, I got, I got a little mad and I said, tone it down. Really? You're a woman telling me I need to tone it down. Frankly, we women need to be toning it up. Tone it down. Oh, hell no. We need to tone it up. Yes. Women have been moving the needle forward for a long time. I'd like to see a female FBI director. How about that? Who's out there listening who could make that happen? You know, sorry, Christopher Ray. I'm not saying I want to replace you right now, but if the, the opportunity ever comes, let's have a female FBI director. Women aren't going to get to these positions by toning it down. We're going to get there by toning it up. And am I nervous about that? Am I scared? 
are people going to hate me for my book? I know I'm going to have a lot of haters. I, I, I just went through an interview with psychology today. And the interview is about women who are doing different things. And the interviewer asked me, she said, how do you think your book is going to be received? And I said, you know, on the very far left, I'm going to have a lot of people who aren't even going to read my book because I worked for the FBI, an institution that is perceived as being extremely far right and conservative. On the far right, I'm going to have a lot of haters because they're not going to like what I have to say. They may think, oh, I'm going to read this book about the FBI. And then after they read it, go, oh, hell no. I do not agree with what she has to say. I don't like what she has to say. But what I said to the interviewer was this. There's a lot of real estate in the middle, which is where I stand. There's a lot of middle ground. And I'm hoping that there are a lot of readers of my book. I hope they'll join me there in that middle ground and that that large piece of real estate where we can actually talk about things and and listen to what I have to say. This is a brave move to write this. Basically, you talk about individual men who during your career were roadblocks. They weren't thinking about the full mission, about the work. They were just thinking about this woman who is in my way. Yes, there were men who thought I was in their way. But I also think as my career moved forward, I think there were men who actually didn't want to see a woman in the position that I had or to have a a, a voice at the table. And I think that that was part of it. I think that as a street agent, you know, when you're, when you're street agents and, and you're working together and you're on a squad and you're part of a team, it's a little different than when a woman is in a position where she has a voice at the table. And I think that that bothers some men. What you're doing is absolutely wonderful, you know, with your podcasts and you bring people's attention to, to what's going on in the FBI. That's what I'm hoping will happen here. Haters on both sides. Yes. But I hope that there will be this middle ground, this real estate in the middle where people will understand men and women will understand what I'm, what I'm trying to say and, and how I'm just, how I just want to make the FBI a better organization. Incidentally, I, I've had a couple of guys, some of my retired male agent friends reach out to me and go, Kathy, I haven't read your book, but I know you and I know what you're going to say. And I know how you're going to say it and good on you because I've been waiting for somebody to say what I know you're going to say. And I was like, oh my gosh, that, that was gratifying. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Like I said at the very beginning, expectation shattering. Thank you. People listening to this are going to say that you wrote this book out of anger. Did you write it because you were angry? Not even close. I mean, I didn't, I honestly, Jerry, I didn't discover my anger till I was writing it. I truly meant to just write this book and sort of tell those funny, you can't believe this stuff happens to you kind of stories and make it kind of fun and inviting and just, you know, sort of a a, a romp and an adventure. And then after I started writing some of the later, you know, some of the stories that I did add to it, I realized how angry and brutal I was. I mean, knew I knew that when I came back from China that I had changed. There was something about me and how I felt about the FBI. It had changed. But I didn't realize the depth of that change until I started writing it down. The lawsuit that's going on now, could you talk about that? Because I think a lot of people would say, Okay, well, all this stuff happened to Kathy when she went through the FBI Academy in 1987. When I saw the lawsuit, these women coming forward, I knew I was on the right track. Because if it happened to me back in 1987 and it's still happening, then it's happened in that time in between then and now. The lawsuit is why I am having this conversation with you. 
that is what makes this relevant and what makes it necessary for me to bring it to the listeners. I'm going to put a link to an article or two about the lawsuit. But basically, it's about, I think it's about 16 women. 16 women. Mm -hmm. Who have joined together, some of them who were at the FBI Academy and were dismissed or kicked out because of issues, whether it was firearms or because someone thought they didn't have what it would take to be an agent. And then some of them are women who you know, were in the FBI working who felt that they had been discriminated against. And so I've never mentioned the suit, which is kind of disingenuous of me, you know, as somebody who's really trying very hard to increase recruitment and increase people joining the FBI. But I will put a link to the articles about the lawsuit in the show notes for your episode so that people can look at it themselves. Sure. All right. So who should read your book? You know, I had to ask myself that when I was writing it because my agent said, you've got to know who your audience is. And so I really thought about that. And my book is really for women. I want men to read it too, but it's written for a female audience, those young women who are thinking about the FBI. And I hope women who who are looking at, at jobs where they're going to be the only woman at the table. I hope they read it and go, you know what? I don't have to change. You know, I can be who I am and contribute. And I want those young women to know that. Wow. All right. So we've come to the point of the interview that we can learn a little bit more about you. When did you join the FBI? And Kathy, why did you join the FBI? I honestly had no thought to joining the FBI when I went to college. I was going to go to medical school. So I was a pre-med major and I was going to become a surgeon. But from the time I was about 15 or 16 up through, you know, maybe my sophomore year college, I was fortunate enough to be able to work in surgery at the the local hospital where I grew up in during my summers and spring breaks and Christmas breaks. And I worked as a surgical technician. You know, I was right there at the table, but I also was allowed to be on call for the emergency room and also the doctor's office so that I could get a well-rounded feel of what being a surgeon is like. You do surgery, but you get called into ER and you have doctors. And I realized I love the science of medicine. I love like microbiology where I could, you know, go in the lab and grow stuff in a Petri dish, but I didn't necessarily like the people part of medicine. And so I decided to change my major. I started working on international business. I thought, well, I want to do something international. So let me just focus on that. And I actually took a couple of different classes. I, I'm going to take something besides science and microbiology and, and calculus and all that. So I took a Russian language class and I took a creative writing class and I absolutely loved the Russian class. I loved learning a foreign language. And about that time, a family friend reached out and said, you know what? You want to do something different. You're adventurous. You want to do something that other women don't do. Have you ever thought about looking at the FBI and the Secret Service and the CIA and the State Department? They have women in those organizations and they do things internationally. And it sounds like it's, you know, adventurous and right up your alley. So I started applying for all of those organizations and ended up with the FBI. So you retired in 2013? Yes. So what have you been doing since then? When I first retired, I promised myself a year off to think about what I really wanted to do. I was reluctant to go and try to get one of those jobs that a lot of legats get, like global investigator or international security with a a large corporation. I wasn't sure that's something I wanted to do. But, you know, after about a year, I started going out and finding jobs and doing interviews. Just as I thought it would be, the jobs didn't sound all that interesting to me. And I just felt like I would be taking a step back. And I had always had in the back of my mind, the thought that I would, if nothing else, at least write my stories down about the FBI. I realized that if I wanted to paint a broader picture 
that it would have to be in the form of some type of book. And that's when I started writing, taking writing classes, learning the business of writing. It's a long process, as you know, and then, you know, the, the whole publishing process. So it's kept me really busy all this time. And it's, it's, it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience. I give my guests the last word at the very end to, you know, sum up the message that they want to leave with everyone. So Kathy, what would you like to say? I would like to say that my career with the FBI was phenomenal. I would not trade it for the world. It gave me a foundation of friendship, commitment. It gave me a foundation of confidence in myself. And even when faced with some of the challenges, you know, they always say that whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger, but it's the truth. You know, the, the challenge that I faced in the FBI did make me stronger, but it also made me realize what I want, what I'm capable of, and what I want to fight for. And I really think that that's probably the most important thing that, that I take away at the very end of my career, especially now when you know, the world is the way it is and we're facing the challenges that we are internationally and in this country. Being in the FBI gives you the resiliency to face challenges like that and sit down and figure out how you're going to face them. And would I have gained that in some other job or career? Maybe, but certainly not to the depth and extent that I have gained that in the FBI, along with so many lifelong friends who I love dearly. I would never have gotten that. So to sum it all up, I would not have missed a single minute of it. Not for anything. And that's the end of the interview. Don't forget about the special Zoom meetup with Kathy to discuss her book and for us to answer any questions you may have about being women FBI agents. I'll be sending out more details to reader team members. So if you're not yet a member of my reader team, please sign up now. There's a link to join in your podcast app's description of this episode and on my website. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a couple of photos of Kathy Sturman, links to FBI posts about the League at program and female agents, a link to more FBI retired case file review episodes featuring league ads and overseas assignments, and for those news articles about the lawsuit that we mentioned during the interview. Of course, you'll also find a link to where you can purchase Kathy's book, It's Not About the Gun, Lessons from My Global Career as a Female FBI Agent. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them read the post on my website, How to Listen to a Podcast. And don't forget to follow FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to audio. I would also love it if you checked out the link for my books and your podcast app's description of this episode. My nonfiction books, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, which goes through 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI and books, TV, and movies. And then there's the companion book, FBI Word Search Puzzles, fun for armchair detectives. My FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad crime series features flawed female FBI agent Carrie Wheeler. All of my books are available wherever books are sold as ebooks, print books, and audiobooks. If you've already picked up copies of my books, please consider leaving a review. Reviews help readers find good books. Thank you for listening to the very end, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.